This is Off Leash Canine Training in Northwest Arkansas, and we're going live today on Leash List to go over a few things, um, some of the questions y'all have put in, but then also how to use structured play and a few other things to eliminate some behaviors that you may not like, and then also further uh, relationship with your dog. Um, I'm Matt. Marshall. And today Marshall will be going over a few things with his personal dog, Dozer, uh, who he rescued and is just an overall amazing pup. Super happy, super sweet, super loving. Um, and definitely come on in with some questions. Uh, I'll be back writing these down and then we'll have a question and answer session after a little bit of this structured play. Thanks, Matt. So, uh, as Matt said, this is Dozer. He's my personal dog. He was in the shelter for a little over a year. Um, a lot of people had considered him unadoptable. Um, the city uh, animal control kind of wanted to put him down for a little bit. But he's vastly misunderstood and had some issues. And So you may have a dog like that, or you may have a dog that's just kind of um, got his own little personality and you're kind of wondering how to open him up and make him a little bit more confident. One of the best ways I know how to do that is through play. But not just through play, it's structured play. So when I say that, I mean we're going to play a game, but it's going to have structure just like you would have structure in a game. So there'll be rules, and there'll be goals, and there'll be penalties. So rules would be things like if I'm playing uh, fetch with a dog, you bring the ball back. That's one of the rules. Um, you know, you let go of the ball when I say leave it or out or drop or something like that. A penalty might, might be if you're playing tug with your dog and they bite your hand and attempt to get the toy, you know, obviously not being aggressive, but you might stop the game for a minute. That might be a penalty. Um, and then obviously the goal is for um, in tug or something like that is for the dog to get the toy. Um, so anytime we're talking about play, um, we've got to think about it from the dog's perspective. So when a dog plays, and in some essence it's going to be an imitation of hunting. So in hunting we've got chasing, stalking, fighting, celebrating, consuming. And so we want to try to figure out what each individual dog enjoys from that part. So some dogs are going to enjoy running and getting something, chasing it and bring it back like a retriever. Some dogs are going to more enjoy the stalking and chasing and fighting aspect of it. So we want to kind of look into what, what turns your dog on, so to speak, and let him have an outlet for them drives. If we give them an outlet for the natural drive and the biological needs that they have, then we're much less likely to have to deal with behaviors that we don't want. For instance, a puppy biting at your hand or a dog biting at your hand and nipping at your kids and chasing family members and things like that. If we give them a game where they can have an outlet for those energies, then we have a much better chance of being successful. So we can also teach them um, impulse control through these games. So start asking for some obedience in the process of playing the game. So Dozer just enjoys just about any type of game, but most dogs that I, that I work with or, or in some way like to engage in a bit of that biting and fighting. Um, and tug and, and flirt pull are amazing options for that. So we're going to show you a tug first. <coughs> this is a, a tug that's made specifically for it. Um, there's all kinds of things you can use out there. Generally, I want it to be something that's going to be a little soft. Um, they make them out of leather. You can find them on Amazon. They're not really expensive. But this is a tug toy. Uh, and what we want is for the dog to bite it and get it away from us. We're not going to make it super easy for them all the time. We're going to make it a fun game, make it a little challenging. So we can make them miss some, but we also want them to win the game. So, so we don't want to ask the dog to let it go every time they get it. We want them to win some, we want them to lose some, we want them to have fun. So we'll just show you kind of how the game starts. When, when I'm ready to play with those, the first thing I say is, are you ready? Are you ready, boy? Are you ready? Are you ready? And then I can tell him at any point, yeah, that's a good boy, Dozer. That's a good boy, Dozer. Yeah, yeah, that's a good boy. That's a good boy, Dozer. Yeah, good boy. So we're praising him for doing some behaviors that in another setting may be unwanted. Yes, good boy. Life like, leave it. Yes, good boy. That can apply to 
so many things in life. You ask a dog to drop or leave something, you can think <clears throat> some random piece of food on the ground or some piece of trash that they might want to put back. <laughs> I know. So, <laughs> useful life skill we can teach you in the context of the game. Get it. Yes. Yes, good boy. Good boy. Yeah. Good boy. Oh. Sometimes we want to play keep away. That's perfectly fine. We can make a thing that we can't get. Direct subject, we had one pop up. How do you teach the leave it command? The leave it command. So it's real simple. <clears throat> First thing I want to do is get them psyched up about the game. And once they're excited to play the game, <clears throat> then I have them. So they have the toy. The first thing I want to do is stop moving it. It doesn't really get it out already, but I'll freeze it to my body just like this and start asking for leave it. I'm not going to pull it out of their mouth. I'm not going to fight over it. I'm just going to stop it from moving. And then just start asking for leave it or drop or out or whatever you want the word to be. The word doesn't matter. <clears throat> and then as soon as they let their mouth out of it, boom, start the game again. Good boy. Good boy. So they learn that the faster they leave it, the faster the game can start. That's a good boy knows. Yes. So leave it. Good. Yes! Good boy! So, you just stop the thing from moving, freeze it to your body, don't fight for the toy, just start asking for leave it or drop or out or whatever word you're going to use. As soon as they let go of it, boom, the game gets to start again. It's really that simple. So, next question coming in. We've had a few different versions of this from my dog's territorial and barks at everything that passes. 
um, to excessive barking, um, but this directly was how to get dogs to stop barking at every delivery driver. At every delivery driver. So we want, we want the dog to, to start thinking about that situation differently. You can use play, if you know a delivery driver is coming, you can use play to play while that thing's happening. <clears throat> but there's lots of different ways you can do counter conditioning. You just want, them to, want the dog to start stacking positive interactions um, so that they can start to change their mind about that event. <clears throat> and that's called counter conditioning. So the main thing to do is to pay good attention to your dog because timing in these things are the most important thing. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, if your dog is toy motivated, use a toy. If your dog is food motivated, use a toy, or excuse me, food. And if your dog's affection mo motivated, you can use that. Whatever motivates your dog, that's going to be the tool. And so, <clears throat> sit at your door and have a leash on your dog. You definitely want to have a leash on your dog. Let me grab one here and put it on Dozer. Thing to add to that would be if uh, you know it might be the doorbell if that's it you can sit at home ring the doorbell and give your dog yeah you can set that up really really easily perfect so my dog listens in a controlled environment but how do I get it to respond in a new environment okay that's a great question um, that stops a lot of people and discourages a lot of people actually so the big thing is is first of all be um, when you're in that low environment, be very particular in how you're asking for things. Um, don't say their name a lot, like, Fluffy, Fluffy, hey, Fluffy, sit, sit, Fluffy, Fluffy, sit. Don't do that to your dog, it's confusing. Um, if you use this one word, it means one thing. So if I need my dog to sit, does her come? Sit, good. So very, very simple, sit. If I have to ask a second time, all I'm gonna say is sit, 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 sit. Don't start changing the way you say it. That way, your dog starts to learn a particular behavior pattern. Um, and what happens is, is when you get in the higher distraction, if you're using those extra words, your dog gets more confused and, um, and doesn't know what they're supposed to do. But if you keep your communication simple, when you get into that higher distraction, your dog is going to be more likely to lean on that behavior because he knows what that means. So oftentimes when a dog is misbehaving in public, whether that's reacting to a certain stimuli like a bicycle or other dogs or other people, it's because they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. And when we're talking to them, we're saying, no, 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 hey, no, Fluffy, Fluffy, hey, Fluffy, sit. We're telling them 10 billion different things and the dog doesn't know what to do. So guess what? They react because they want to get more space. So when you go out, if you are consistent in the way that you tell your dog to do things, then your dog is more likely to respond and will make much faster progress. Perfect. And a new question then is how to get your do dog to stop jumping on everyone. So that's a question we get a lot. Um, and, the, and the first thing I tell people is I don't fix that. And that kind of that gives me a lot, of, a lot of strange looks. Why? Because first of all, I, I, you know, I, 
I don't want to punish my dog or correct my dog if I haven't already taught them what they're supposed to be doing, right? So rather than setting my dog up to correct them for jumping on strangers, I'm first going to teach my dog how to sit. And if I have a dog that understands that sit means put your bottom to the ground and keep it there, if and when I happen to say, yes, you can come pet my dog, then I can tell my dog, good, sit, sit, good boy, right? And I don't have to worry about him jumping on other people because my dog understands that sit means to put your bottom to the ground and keep it there. And when you have a repetition like that, every time the dog gets attention from strangers and things like that, he happens to be a lot of times where a dog jumps on you and he gets this interaction, even for us it might feel negative where we're pushing the dog away and saying no, you're actually giving the dog what they want, which is the attention. But if they learn that they get the attention by putting their bottom to the ground or, or standing without jumping, then you're going to have a repeatable behavior. Perfect. And we just got a question in, my dog is getting old and hard of hearing, how can I still teach her these things? You know, um, hard of hearing is, is not as hard to deal with as you think. Dogs will often learn hand signals much easier than they do words. And what's, what's kind of key about that, I alluded to it a little bit earlier, is we tend to, with our voices, explain more. We say more things, thinking that it'll help the dog. It actually confuses them. So when we start to add simple hand gestures to the things that we're asking our dog to do in, in conjunction with a leash, um, whether your dog can hear or see or not, they're always going to know what this leash means. But when we start adding hand signals into those things, then we can really start communicating quickly. So, for instance, so right there, I just told my dog, come, sit, place, sit, and break. And it's just about repetitions. I've added in hand signals for those, for those things. So um, you can also praise your dog with a hand gesture. Um, we typically do this or this um, to say good boy or girl when we have a deaf dog that comes in for lessons or training. Um, but just add hand signals. And then also add in a food reward that your dog enjoys. So just so you know, Dozer is definitely getting some compliments. He's a good uh, boy. Yes, he is. He was sure. unadoptable two years ago, believe it or not. And <laughs> we don't need to get started on that. Um, so, what we'll go into next is just kind of a basic question. What, how do y'all feel about kenneling at night? So, crate training, in my opinion, is a very, very valuable tool. Um, there's a number of reasons that I want a dog um, to be comfortable in a crate. First of all, when a dog is comfortable in a crate, it gives them their den fix. Dogs have a den mentality. And so if you were to have a wild dog, and of course we're not talking about wild animals here, but if they were, they would dig a hole in the ground and sleep in it. It would be barely big enough for them to get in, turn around, and lay down. So dogs have a natural instinct to enjoy that when they're sleeping. It gives them separation and space and time to decompress and really rest. So I'm a huge fan of, of crate training a dog. Does that mean you have to keep your dog in a crate all the time? No. But it's an easy way to provide structure for your dog and give them a way to decompress from things. I, I recommend feeding in a crate so they don't get pressure from other dogs or people while they're eating. It allows them to slow down and eat. Um, but yes, sleeping in a crate is a very good idea. Um, I, you know, if even if you're not having your dog sleep in a crate, I definitely recommend having moments where they're in a crate. Heaven forbid they need to go to the vet, stay over the night. I want the crate to be a place of, of uh, de-stressing, not causing stress. So if, if my dog has to go in a crate and be at the vet for the night, being in that crate is actually going to calm him down rather than, rather than stress him out. But we can also use the crates for so many other things, potty training. We can use it as a way to get a dog down to, uh, into their structure so we can deal with behavioral issues. So a crate is a very positive thing if you teach it to train right. Absolutely. Um, and so we have a new comment. I wish my dog was that well behaved. You definitely can. Give us a call. You definitely can. Um, so, a few uh, other questions. Um, do you have experience with Bernie's Mountain Dogs? We do. Yes. We love them. Absolutely. And we do love all dogs. We do think all dogs are smart. So, definitely, any dog you have, definitely just give us a call. We can help. Um, how to get your six-month-old puppy to leave the cat alone? Well, um, 
again, the leash it is where it all starts. Um, you know, I, I always recommend that when, when you're training a dog, and especially puppies, that you allow them to drag a leash around. What I tell people is to go to Walmart or somewhere like that, buy the cheapest leash you can find and cut the handle of it off. And what that's going to do is when you do need to redirect your dog away from something or tell them no, you're going to have something that you can give a clear signal with. If I were to start reaching at Dozer's head, it's going to freak him out a little bit, right? And he's forgot about what he's doing. But if I simply just give him a leash, correct, a leash correction, tell him to come towards me, now, I, now the message is clear. So if there's a cat over here and the dog's messing with the cat, I can say, uh-uh. -huh and walk away. And now I can say good boy and you know tell the dog he's doing the right thing. And in reference to the question that just came in about my dog getting into everything he's not supposed to, coffee, chocolate, etc. same answer. Yeah. Um, the leash, you have to have it on if your dog is going for so, it. Yeah. And, and leaving can be part of that as well. Um, and you can use whatever the thing is that, that he's wanting to stay away. I like to get a treat that the dog likes. Um, does or likes them all. But I can take a treat Throw it out on the floor, huh? Leave it. Good boy. Good boy. As soon as he leaves the treat on the floor, I give him one out of my hand. Leave it. Good boy. Throw a treat on the floor, leave it. Good boy. Okay. You can have it. So that's a very simple way to, you, to further teach your dog leave it in the real world kind of setting. But again, the leash is, is the clear signal there. Um, staying on that topic, how to train a dog, how to place. Place. The most versatile command, in my opinion, that I know how to teach a dog. It's uh, hang out on your bed while we cook, eat clean, FedEx guy comes to the door, pizza guy comes to the door, the doorbell rings. The place command is really only limited by your imagination. Um, so first, we'll just quickly go through the rules of place. First rule is... Uh, it has to be a defined object, right? So I cannot ask him to place on one of these rubber mats because it's surrounded by other rubber mats. It can be literally anything. A cot, a bed, a piece of tile on your carpet floor, a piece of carpet on your tile floor, literally anything. A blanket, it doesn't matter, just so long as it's identifiable from its surroundings. Um, secondly, it needs to be something that they're allowed to be on. So if they're not normally allowed to be on the couch, don't ask them to place on the couch. And thirdly, because the place command is such a confidence booster, we never ask a dog to place on something that we're not willing to help them get on. Help can come in the form of uh, just extra encouragement and treats. It can be a a rat. It can come in the form of uh, putting a, a familiar object next to the new object. And it, it can even be picking the dog up and placing them on there and letting them jump off a few times to build up the confidence. So the first thing we do with new dogs living is we start walking them over a new object. As soon as they get on there, yes, good boy, good boy, Dozer. Get them to walk over the object a few times, good boy. And I will say before you do this, you want to make sure your dog under understands how to sit. Um, good boy, Dozer. And so once your dog is comfortably walking over the object, you're going to ask for a sit while they happen to be on it. Sit. Good, down, good boy. So once they're on it, you get them in a sitter or a down and say, good place, place, good boy, good place, place, good boy. And then add in the break word, break, good boy. And then you release something and then rinse and repeat and slowly add more and more duration to the, to the process. So I uh, just got a question in, any tips for separation? Worried about our new house and him being comfortable when we're gone? Tends to scratch at doors when stressed. Yes, absolutely. That goes back to a lot of the crate stuff that we talked about earlier. So one of the big things with the, with the, you know, the quarantine, the corona thing, and everybody being home with their dogs and animals more often, is that you're, you're all running the risk a little bit of creating some separation anxiety. All dogs, all people, have separation anxiety to some degree. When I'm not with my dog, I miss them. Separation anxiety. I want to be back with my dogs if I'm not with them. <clears throat> so, the way to kind of cut that off is to start allowing them to have alone time in short spurts. Don't start this when you're leaving for 12 hours. You know, start it when you're going to be there at the house. Um, if you have a crate, 
Put your dog in the crate. In the instant they quiet down, let them out. And then start to increase that duration as you go. But it's important, even if, if now you're at home, you're working from home, you're with your dog all the time, and you're able to take them everywhere with you, trust me, we do that as well. It's important that you allow your dog to have some alone time, right? Um, so just, that's the main thing, is just starting off with small increments, small durations, and then building it more and more as you go. Perfect. Um, we have any tips on dog shredding toys? Dog shredding toys. So, honestly, uh, um, my answer may not be popular, but, but honestly, I don't leave toys out for my dogs. Um, the toys like the, the tub toy, the flirt ball, they only come out when I'm playing with my dogs. Um, a lot of the toys that you could leave out for your dog can be dangerous. Your dog has an instinct and wants to chew. So the alternative for me, really, what I normally tell people is to put the toys away and give them an appropriate chew, whether that's a calm, uh, a raw bone, a chewy stick, whatever it is that you're giving your dog, make sure it's something that is appropriate for them to chew on and just put the toys away. Perfect. And then probably one of the biggest questions we get asked here, um, how do you get your dog off leash? How do you know how, when to trust them? Well, um, you get your dog off leash when, you, when you're working with your dog with the leash so much. We use a tool that's called an e-collar, and we use it just like an invisible leash. So when we're teaching a dog what it means, we pair it with the leash constantly and get lots of repetition. So that when, you know, by the time I'm realizing, well, I don't actually use my leash anymore to tell the dog to do anything, then I can drop the leash. Does it come? That's kind of the pull away place. Good place. Sit. Break the chat, brother. So it comes to repetition. You'll know when your dog's ready, but if it, you it, it, you feel comfortable communicating with your dog with the tool that you're using. Um, so whether that be an e-collar where, you're, where you know how to use it in a gentle way, and you've paired it with the leash, you're gonna be comfortable with the, with the operation. You're gonna be comfortable with your dog's response. And we got a question about where we are located and our website, and that is getting posted in the comments. Uh, we are located in Springdale, yep. right off of Highway 412. And our website is FayettevilleDogTrainer.com, uh, but we do serve the entire area. We do have a location in Little Rock as well. We do um, lessons in River Valley too. Yes. Um, so we are coming to an end, uh, about of our last five minutes, four minutes. So any last questions that y'all have, please ask them now. So we'll go ahead and get those answered for you. Um, this is definitely just a great time to take advantage of. The, you being home with your pups and training them. Uh, what type of collar? It is an e-collar, and that is both the brand name and what it's called. We use a collar made by e-collar technologies. There's a couple other brands out there that are really good as well. Um, but the ones we use are made by e-collar technologies. You can look at them on e-collar.com. Um, what they are is, is an electrical stimulation unit exactly like a mobile TENS unit. So a TENS unit is used in a doctor's office, physical therapy offices for pain sedation and muscle regurg regrowth. It does use electricity, but it uses a very different frequency of electricity than what you think of as a shock collar. So rather than a sharp, pointy, tall uh, shock that you normally think of, we use what's called blunt stimulation, to where we basically use it to where we can tap on the shoulder, and again, we use it as an invisible leash so that we can guide the dog and communicate with them. We don't use it to punish a dog. Um, any tips for introducing a kitten to an existing dog? Well, first of all, go slow. Um, you know, it's, it's like cats and dogs. So sometimes that you're going to find a good match and sometimes there won't be a great match. Um, the big thing is to go slow. Keep them on a leash so that you can kind of de clearly define what the rules are. And you can definitely uh, give us a call, send us any videos about that. Um, that is something that is a little bit tougher for us to answer without seeing it directly. Um, and how to, on a very similar topic, how to encourage puppies and grumpy old pups to coexist. So, first of all, um, the grumpy old pups, they kind of deserve to have their space. Puppies can be pushy, so it's, it's more about us intervening before the older dog has to. Um, so if, it, if an older dog doesn't want the little puppy giving them, giving them problems, then it's our responsibility to make sure that the puppy doesn't do that. Again, let your dog carry a leash around. 
If he goes up to the if he goes up to the older dog and it's clear that the older dog doesn't want any of that, then just call the puppy away. Um, but again, those are those situations where it's a, on us to act before the problem happens, so that the older dog learns that he doesn't have to react because we will, and the younger puppy learns that he has to have a little bit better manners with the older dog. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in. Again, I'm Matt. Marshall. And we have some several other trainers here as well uh, who we'd love to get y'all to meet. If you do have any questions, visit us on Instagram, Facebook, OL Canine Arkansas, Off Leash Canine Training Northwest Arkansas on Facebook, 479-301-4565, or our website, FayettevilleDogTraining.com. Otherwise, thank you all so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and definitely let us know if you have more questions. Yeah, that's a good point. Oh. Uh, how do you dent your dogs from digging holes in the yard? Leash again. Perfect. Uh, direct your dog clearly with the leash. Let them understand what you're asking. Awesome. Well, again, that'll wrap us up. Hope you all all have a great night.